Next up, we are fortunate to have Dr. Richard Criley. Uh, Dr. Criley is an Emeritus Professor of Horticulture at the University of Hawaii, having worked at the UH from 1968 to 2010, which is 42 and a quarter years. He got his PhD from UCLA in 1968. His research has em embraced several themes, physiology of flowering of tropical ornamentals, foliage plant production, use of growth regulators in horticulture, production of ornamental Hawaiian native plants, and alternative trees for Hawaii landscapes. Tropical crops on which he has conducted research include gingers, heliconias, bird of paradise, proteas, uh, virea, rhododendrons, bougainvilleas, dendrobium orchids, various lay flowers, and plumerias, as well as traditional flower floriculture crops. Um, he has taught like 14 courses, and I probably sat in a whole bunch of them. <laughs> and uh, he has advised nearly 40 masters and PhD graduate students, and continues to be active as a member of graduate student committees, reviews manuscripts for colleagues and scientific journals. Dr. Criley con con contributes guest lectures to his colleagues' courses. Today, he'll be talking about Strelitzia, a long-term crop. Dr. Criley, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Glenn. I've been behind a couple of closed doors for the past couple of years. I don't get to talk to people during the day, so my voice has gotten a little weak. My work with Bird of Paradise began over 50 years ago. When I came to Hawaii, I wanted to work with something different from orchids, or pardon me, from carnations, chrysanthemums, and roses, which is what most of my colleagues of that era were working with. And I set out plots of bird of paradise and red ginger early in my career and began to do some, uh, uh, basically it was nutrition work to start with, but as we started harvesting flowers, we noticed some interesting patterns in the uh, flowering behaviors. The bird of paradise is native to South Africa. It was brought to England in 1773 by a Scottish gardener who Kew Royal Botanic Gardens had sent out as a plant collector to South Africa. The area that it comes from is, uh, well, think of Southern California in terms of the climate. Quite a trip. 1772, poor Francis Masson, the Scottish gardener who did the discovery, traveled over uh, 100 miles out of the southern part of South Africa, the Cape Town area, into the eastern area near Durban, finding the bird of paradise near the streams and mountains. Family, Strelitziaceae. It's one of eight families in the gigantic order of the Zingiberales. The Zingiberales include things like the bananas, heliconias, two, two groups of gingers, marantas, OEACE, and the Strelitzia. Three genera in that family, the Ravenellas, known as traveler's palms, the Phenacospermum, a South, South American plant, that uh, probably has very little redeeming value in terms of ornamental qualities because it's about 30 foot tall when it blooms with a large gangly inflorescence. The Strelitzias, at the time, King George, he had a wife from Germany, from the German house of Strelitz, and the taxonomist at Kew wound up identifying this genus as Strelitzia in honor of the new queen. Number of species, I think, is still somewhat undetermined. The one that we know most is the one that was named for the queen, Reginae. And there are several forms of it with smaller leaves or actually no leaves that look like the uh, spiky leaves of a juncus or rush. The white Bird of Paradise, Nicolae, 
which is a rather large woody bird. And then there's supposed to be another white known as Augusta, which I've never seen any photos of. So of the Regini, we have the one that is most recognizable to folks. And then Parvifolia has a very small leaf blade at the tip of the long leaves, but the flowers are much the same. And Junxia has no leaf blade, it just looks like a giant spike. But for those of you who are interested in growing this crop, besides the flowers, the foliage is also a marketable item. There are a number of different forms of bird of paradise foliage. As a matter of fact, some of the early taxonomists named varieties or forms based on the different kinds of foliage. And the dried leaves, which have to be cleaned out of the plants anyway, also have marketable value for uh, dried crops in the fall. We don't have much in the way of name clones of uh, cultivars for Bird of Paradise. I did a sabbatic leave and was down in South Africa in 1983. And at that time, Kirstenbosch Gardens was touting their Kirstenbosch Gold, which after uh, apartheid was over and Nelson Mandela was brought in as the new leading uh, president for the South Africa, they changed the name over to Mandela's Gold, in which the teeples are a much brighter uh, yellowish color compared with the typical orange of Strelitzia reginae. And then I was in uh, Canary Islands one time, and we found that instead of having blue petals, there were a few plants that they had, had been identified in their fields that had white petals. I learned also that Monrovia Nursery at one time carried the white petal form. The petals, in, um, there are actually about seven flowers in the green so-called bract or boat. And different boat colors, they are anything from green to almost bluish, often with a red rim. So there are different selections that can be made. What we might call petals are, are actually tepals, the orange structures. They're sort of like sepals, but because they've got color to them, they've been given a, a special name by the botanist. And then the real true flowers are the blue ones. There's three of them, two that are long and folded together over the stigmas and uh, stamens, and then a s short, smaller one down at their base. When a bird lights on the flower seeking nectar, it splits the two petals open, exposing the stamens, and the pollen gets on the bird's feet, and the next bird, next flower that it lights on may get pollinated. The fruit set is a capsule. It's about oh, two and a half to three inches long, six segments to it. And in those segments are born seeds, black shiny seeds with an orange arrow to them. Just a quick uh, look at a couple of the cousins of, of the bird of paradise. The Ravenella, Ravenella or Traveler's Palm. And its inflorescence shown in the photo at the top is a gigantic, probably about two or three foot long inflorescence. It looks vaguely like a uh, upright heliconia with bracts in alternate directions and probably about uh, eight to 10 inches long. When it forms a seed, and you can see a bunch of seed pods there in the middle, those are probably the more salable portions of a, of a, a traveler's palm. The white bird of paradise you often see as an interior plant, but you'll see it outside sometimes up to 25 feet in height, the stiff woody stem and very short stemmed inflorescences with uh, white 
white flowers to them. In the U.S., Bird of Paradise was largely produced in California. Uh, production in California was largely winter months from late fall through spring. San Diego to Santa Barbara area. In Hawaii, on the other hand, our production was summer months. So just like the protea, the leucospermums, we had our competitive advantage. I remember when Los Angeles hosted the 1984 Olympics, the athletes were awarded uh, bouquets of flowers, and there was always a bird of paradise because that's the city flower of Los Angeles. This being July, August for the Olympics, that meant those bird of paradise probably had to come from Hawaii because that was not the blooming time for California. It's also been grown as a potted plant. However, it's kind of large for a potted plant. We'd like to find some dwarf forms of it. And of course, you see it in the landscape, interior scapes, and the cut flower growers, although there are not many of those left either in Southern California or here in Hawaii. And I think there are probably more bird of paradise shipped in out of Mexico. This is our production for the bird of paradise in Hawaii. You can see how the production has dropped from the late 80s to the late 1990s, early 2000s, as people have gone out of business. And poor Eric says, anybody got bird of paradise for me to sell? This is what bird of paradise production looked like in Southern California in the late 70s. This field now is filled with homes. This was Sue Robertson's patch of Bird of Paradise in the northern uh, part of this island. And I still don't know why it's no longer uh, functional but there were a lot of plants. This is a relatively young field. Probably started from individual plantlets that were stuck into the ground. In my opinion, they were probably a little bit too close together if you're going to have a long-term crop because as the bird of paradise plant expands, by the time eight or 10 years arrives, you can't get in between the plants to harvest. In Europe, a large part of the bird of paradise come from the Canary Islands, the so-called Hawaii of Europe. So basically, bird of paradise is propagated in two ways, either from seed or by division. When you look at a bird of paradise, the, the leaves are opposite each other in a fan. But at some point, that fan begins to split. And you can divide that split and make two plants out of it. Well, if you keep a plant going for five or six or eight or 10 years, you're going to wind up with a lot of fans and the potential for a lot of splits. But the root system goes pretty deep. When I was setting up my experiments, my ag technician and I were digging a plant out and we were probably about 18, 20 inches down and still hadn't reached the bottom of the root system. My ag tech said to me, Dr. Criley, you don't have to work this hard. We kept digging. Probably the best way is to root them in containers. And I'll show you the slide in a moment. But anyway, this is the, the way you go about it. You cut them apart. If you have roots that are left on the, the base of that plant, they don't really regenerate new root systems. They have to be uh, reinitiated from the base of that stem. We found that if we dusted the base of the, that stem with a fungicide, we didn't have as much rot as those old roots decayed. And then new roots developed, and you, as you can see by the image in the lower right, 
they're fairly thick, probably about as thick as your thumb, maybe a little thicker, very fleshy and brittle. So transplanting them means difficulty in uh, bruising or breaking the new root system. Sort of a repeat of the previous slide, but showing a bunch of students from my plant propagation course who had Bird of Paradise to divide for my research. They didn't know it at the time. They did an exercise in plant propagation. Division. There was about a 100-acre plot on the north shore of Oahu that they decided it was going to be a Bird of Paradise plot. They brought in a bunch of uh, divisions from California, lined out the ground cloth like they would for pineapple, stuck the divisions in the ground like they would for pineapple crowns, and waited. Well, about three months later, before things had effectively rooted, we had one of Oahu's major rainstorms, and about a foot of mud washed down from the hillsides, and pretty much covered most of this field. They salvaged a few plants, and for a few years, we had Bird of Paradise out of Mokalea area. Here was a unique propagation method that was developed by a fellow in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, this image I took of his poster has too much reflection. But basically, you would take a plant, cut into the base of the plant, and cut a wedge out of the base of the plant down to the uh, growing point. That damage stimulated the axillary buds that were, remained around the stem to develop, instead of as flowers, to develop as vegetative shoots which then could be separated, as you see along the bottom of the poster, as new plantlets. So this is a type of cut, like a big jaws open. And after a period of time, callus is over. There are axillary buds in the base of those leaves, which will develop as shoots. And then you can break those apart and root them as little miniature plants. But probably a better idea is to go with seed. Seed propagation offers its own challenges because the seeds take a long time to germinate, sometimes as long as three months. A number of papers have been published on how to promote faster seed germination. Most of them entail some damage. It's not something that you can scarify readily and get uh, faster germination, but we have learned that uh, scarifying with sulfuric acid and then treating with growth regulators like gibberellins or ethophon or even just hot water can stimulate faster germination of the bird, bird of paradise seed. I have, excuse me, I have a paper on this that is in the Heliconia Society. Heliconia Society International Bulletin that uh, if you're interested, send me an email and we'll get you a copy of, of that paper, which summarizes a lot of different papers that uh, went into this single slide. But realize that even after you get a seedling, it's going to take another three to six years before you have much in the way of flowers. Get your first flowers in about three years but commercial level production is six or seven years down the road. So start now for 2030. So here we have that Bird of Paradise seed pot again, an individual seed. The little orange arrow that is attached to it is thought to be an attractant to birds to get them to come uh, pick on the seeds. They pass the seeds through their, their tract, and then perhaps that improves bird of, paradise, bird of paradise seed germination. And then the seedling, oh, it's probably about three months old. So in the culture of the bird of paradise, and many of these photos were taken back in the 
California fields when I was still a graduate student and we had field trips. You can plant them at various spacings, but uh, as I said, I think five feet is probably the minimum to if you're not going to divide them again after a few years. And then at 10 years, probably, well, the thing of it is all the new growth is to the periphery. It's the base of the plant keeps expanding. That's where the new fans are coming out. That's where most of your new flowers are going to be coming. So the fans that are left in the middle probably are not going to be producing most of your flowers. So again, looking at that uh, field on the right that was going to be inundated by mud, those probably would not have rooted real readily through the, the uh, ground cloth because they're not pineapples. They, they didn't callus over as readily and they probably rotted more. Literature reports on how much to fertilize Bird of Paradise range all over the place. My early studies were done at the University Farm at Waimanalo. We ran up to 600 pounds of nitrogen per acre, which is a pretty expensive fertilization rate. We didn't get that much in the way of difference between our lowest rate and the extra nitrogen, which shows that our, that our the fertility of our soil at Waimanalo was perfectly adequate without adding much. So running fertilizer trials at Waimanalo, I found, wasn't very beneficial. Probably would have been better to have a lower nutrient soil. They get watered year round in South Africa, and they're also basically found near the streams and rivers. And we watered by overhead irrigation, probably delivering about an inch of uh, water per acre per week. Bird of Paradise are pretty tolerant to quite a wide range of temperatures, but as we will see, the temperature regime has a major impact on the seasonality of flowering. Bird of Paradise are not photoperiodic. Lighting them didn't do anything to stimulate flowering. They're a highlight plant. Some of the plants that were measured in southern, southern Africa were in the shade of trees, and they took much longer to bring flowers into maturity than plants that were grown out in full sun. Similarly, we found those kinds of results for plants in Southern California and Hawaii. They're subject to a lot of pests scale insects, mealybugs, white fly, aphids. Bob Paul has done some work on the diseases that impact uh, flowers because the flowers, in order for those individual flowers to em emerge from that bract or boat, it exudes kind of a slimy substance that allows the flowers to, to uh, emerge out of that bract. But that slimy substance also can support botrytis. An interesting management tool was observed at the Canary Islands. They dry down their plants during an off season, then about 10 or 12 weeks before they want to get flowers, then they begin to irrigate again. I didn't, did not get the details of their uh, methodology, how they determined, but they knew when they wanted to have the flowers and they would turn the, turn the water on and the timing was such that by the time their harvests were needed, they had the flowers. So the different flower types, again, with the different uh, colored uh, boats or bracts, different intensities of orange, different intensities of the, the blue petals. You can see an uh, image of the Mandela's gold in the lower, left, lower right corner. And then the off types. 
Now, if you have a, a clientele that is selling to Japanese uh, Ikebana designers, they'll love this. But it's really a mess to pack. There's Sue Robertson. When we visited, one of her uh, harvesters brought her this little miniature stem. And I was saying, oh, that's great. If, if the plant is small like that, that would make a great potted plant. Well, they never knew which plant it came from. In the middle is one that has short, broad leaves, and the flowers stand well above the, the, the foliage. And of course, they're harvested by pulling, so you don't have to reach in with a knife and try to cut things. You just yank the stem, and it disconnects. And there's me in an early day when I had more hair with some longer stems that were taller than I was. For the harvest, particularly if you're shipping, the, the bracts should uh, have be open enough that the flowers are beginning to emerge but have not pushed out yet because those tepals and flower petals will break off uh, in shipping. But because these can be pulsed with a sugar solution, you can pulse them and hold them dry or wet at cool temperatures like 40 degrees, and they'll push out later and be just as long-lived as ones that are handled straight from the field to design. To have the harvesters know what to harvest, special, uh, specially trained workers go out and put these little white envelopes over the inflorescences that are just ready to harvest. It also protects those as they're being harvested so anything that is starting to reflect out of the, the bracts doesn't break off. These, these would be re removed then during processing. You can see how they're handled in the field there in California and others that are handled with the little white envelopes over the inflorescent structure. And then they're graded, and sometimes you have a need for flowers that have already expressed from the, the bracts. So some of them have already begun to age, and you need to break those out. Stems may need to be trimmed to a certain length to fit your shipping cartons. And then, of course, you can have special packs that are going direct to buyers, whether they're online or your retailers that have just ordered small quantities. Just as there are a lot of ways to germinate seed, there are a lot of ways to handle the cut flowers. And the longevity of Bird of Paradise flowers is pretty good. But there are a number of factors that can affect how long you can keep, how long you can hold them, depending on what the stages were when you harvested, whether you gave them a sugar pulse, whether you had other sugar pulsing operations such as gibberellic acid, citric acid, 8-hydroxyquinoline sulfate, thiodiazuron, MCP, silver thiosulfate, etc. Cold storage, whether you stored them dry or wet, whether it was the temperature, and even whether you had insect or disease problems. Fortunately, there's not quite as much in the way of insect problems on the bird of paradise as you have with the gingers and the heliconias. Now gets into the fun part of some of the research that we did. This is the flowering production in California. The blue bar shows the season of high production, basically November through late spring and into April, and their low season of production during the summer months. And here's our seasonality of production in Hawaii. The dotted, dash, dotted or dashed line curve represents temperatures. 
The solid lines represent our production during the 1970s period that I was conducting this work. You can see that our high production, now this uh, temperature has been lagged 23 weeks. So almost half a year between the time of flower initiation and the time of flowering or time for harvest. And uh, this is an impact to consider when you're planning ahead to look at when you're going to be able to harvest for your markets. We had comparative studies going on simultaneously in Australia, South Africa, California, and in Hawaii. Dr. Abraham Kalevi, Alevi of Israel was coordinating these studies. And the low months varied all over the place. The high months, similarly. But for Hawaii, we had the competitive advantage over California for our time of high months, June through October. And while October was high individually for California as a month, their high period tended to be November through May. So we didn't ha have that much of a clash for uh, competitive marketing. My graduate student modeled the leaf emergence times and showed this nice curve, which you know, if, you, if you plot it with a computer, it makes a nice curve. If you plot it with a zigzag, it looks kind of messy. But it shows that we have leaves taking longer to emerge during the summer months and closer to emerge during the winter months or late fall. And then on the right-hand side, the month of leaf emergence and how many of those leaves actually produce the flower of the leaf axle. Every leaf of a bird of paradise has a, a, an axillary bud that will become a flower, but not all of them do. And we determined that there was a temperature relationship here. Here is the month of leaf emergence for California how many days it took from that leaf emergence to flower harvest over 300 days. That's a long time, 10 months, and even more, almost 500 days in the uh, latter part of the year. So their winter flowers came from uh, leaves that may have emerged in September, October and then flowered over 500 days later. This is our flowering diagram for Hawaii. I won't bore you with too much in the way of details, but the left-hand dot is when we count it as leaf emergence from the leaf blade of the leaf that preceded. Then the little half-shaded uh, half circle in the middle is when we first saw the flower come out of the petiole of that leaf. And then finally, the open circle is when we harvested. So we had a fairly long interval in days, but there was still much less than California. South Africa, I would call your attention to the line that is, is at F7, look back at where L7, which is when the leaf emerged, here's where the leaf emerged for the flower that emerged almost 60 weeks later. It takes a long time for the flower to develop in South Africa. We have a turnaround that is much faster here in Hawaii. This is what our Hawaii uh, similar diagram looks like. F1 leaf, or L1 leaf in early January started to flower somewhere around 30 weeks later. 
So that's a lot faster than in uh, South Africa. When the flower, or when the leaf is initiated at its base, the developing flower is about half a millimeter in size. And about when the leaf is fully expanded and mature, the flower inflorescence is about 25 millimeters or about an inch in length. And then the photo on the right shows things all the way to the point at which that flower bud is emerging from the petiole and encloses it. Now you see the little black blades at the base of this uh, stem. Those are flower buds that aborted. They're all about 25 millimeters long and they occur in a specific order. They, the flowers would appear in a spiral around that stem and part of that spiral will have consecutive flower buds aborted and then consecutive flower buds that have gone on to develop into flowers. The flower buds that are aborted, nearly all of them did so during our summer months. And the ones that did not abort in the winter went on to produ produce the flowers that were available for us to harvest in late fall and winter months. Or late, I'm sorry, went on to flower in late spring and summer. So the ones that aborted were the ones that would have flowered in the winter months, but did not. This is the temperature pattern in South Africa. You can see their high temperatures, maybe about 25 degrees Celsius, which is high 70s. They have a long period of cool temperatures in the 650s below. The white patches in this image show temperatures below 15 degrees Celsius in Australia, South Africa, California, and our period in Hawaii, which is the lower left, we have no period below, at least, let me put it this way. This is our Waimanalo plot at the University of Hawaii, low elevation where it's warm. So we have no below 15 degrees Celsius but we do get periods that are warm. And so you can see in uh, both Australia, a little bit of California, and Hawaii, we get periods that are pretty warm. This is about 25 degrees Celsius. In brief, we believe that the seasonality of flowering is very temperature dependent. The best range of temperatures for growing bird of paradise would be where it stays between 15 and 27 degrees Celsius. This favors both vegetative and, and flower production. Below 15, as in South Africa, it's so cold that the flowers don't develop and it takes months, you know, more than, more than a year for flowers to develop. But above 27, we feel that the inflorescence, the, the tiny little flower bud at the base of the leaf is probably aborting and therefore those flowers are not going to be produced and we have a seasonal production. What we don't have is information as to whether those aborted flowers are aborting because of a competition from the other flowers that are developing or whether it is a true temperature effect. I hope I haven't run my, over my time too much, Russell. I'll be happy to take questions. Do you know if there are any hybrids that have been made between the species in Strelitzia? I don't know if there have been hybrids made. Uh, do you know if there is production in Hawaii? Um, the different colored uh, Strelitzia? Uh, Eric asked if I know of production in Hawaii of the different colors of Strelitzia. Uh, I gave yellow flowered forms to the Waimea Arboretum 
my, I lost my plants at the University of Hawaii when we told the grounds crew that they could plant some of our surplus plants and they took everything. And then a bunch of them didn't survive handling. So no, we don't, what, what I would like to see is somebody either growing a batch from seed and selecting the best ones because you can select for different leaf types, you can select for different intensities of orange and blue. You could presumably even select for ones that will throw the double flowered form if you, if you were so interested. And of course, once you find it, the way to ensure it is keep increasing it. I don't know that there has been much in the way of successful bird of paradise done by uh, tissue culture. Thank you.